in my study of the human mind, 30 years of researching, I came across three pieces of research that happened in three different decades, and they had absolutely nothing to do with each other. But when you put their findings together in a particular sequence, sequence, create an undeniable, irrefutable way to explain who we are, why we are the way we are, but then better than that, what we can do about it. So I'm going to convey those three pieces of research to you now. And I use a phrase to talk about these pieces of research, and they are unplugged, or the phrase is unplugged dog dreams. Unplugged stands for one of the pieces of research, dog stands for another piece of research, and dreams for the last piece of research. So unplugged dog dreams. All right, so unplugged. Every single one of us has a little voice that's going on in our head. And it's just talking to itself. And someone, someone might ask, you know, what is he talking about? It's that voice <laughs> <laughs> that asked that question that I am talking about. Okay, That voice in the scientific community is known as sub-vocalization or self-talk. Right? Now this thing is going on all day, every day. It just sits there talking to itself, and by the end of 24 hours, you've had approximately 50,000 self-talks in that day. What the heck are we talking to ourselves about? I mean, I can talk really, really fast. You can hear every single word I'm saying, just like really fast auctioneer, and your brain can talk to itself four times faster. In fact, they've proven that while I am lecturing here, you are talking to yourself more than you are actually listening to me lecture. <laughs> And you don't work with me here, you know? <laughs> so then science has proven through the biochemistry, because every single thought that you have actually has a chemical signature. Okay, so every thought that comes out of your brain elicits chemicals out of your mind, like this little pharmacy here. And every single one has a chemical signature. And so they've been able to measure that the average human being, like you and me, who has these 50,000 self-talks that are going on every day, Roughly 80% of them are negative or limiting in some way. Eighty percent of them. So 40,000. We have 50,000 self-talks every day. 40,000 of them are negative or limiting in some way. Now, it even goes farther than that because of those 50,000 self-talk -talk, self thought forms that we have every day, the average human being who's actually like paying attention to their self-talk is only aware of around 5% or 2,500 of those self-talks. So you got 50,000 self-talks going on every day. You're aware of 5%, 2,500, 80% of which 2,000 are negative or limiting in some way. It's a 4 to 1 ratio. It's like I would say to myself, I'm going to write a book. And my brain will say, you can't write a book. Why would you write a book? If you could write a book, everyone would write a book. <laughs> no, I want to write a book. <laughs> and on and on and on like that all day. So 95% of our thinking is just kind of happening. We're only aware of around 5% of it. 80% of it is negative or limiting in some way. For every positive thought that we have, we have four negative ones. That's not my idea. That's just what is. We've been able to map that, and we know that to be true. So, can we unplug this thing? The answer is no. Because if they unplugged it, they would unplug you. And that's a subject for a whole other book. <laughs> but what we can do is learn to unplug from it. We can't unplug it, but we can learn to unplug from it. So that's what the word unplugged represents. That's what the first piece of research in these three pieces, the unplugged dog dreams, unplugged represents all of that, that we have all of these thoughts, 50,000 a day, 80% are negative or limiting in some way. 40% of 40,000 of them are negative or limiting. I don't know if that's the wind. I wasn't moving. Oh, it may be. Okay. We'll edit that sludge. <laughs> I'm going to plug them. Really? <laughs>
<laughs> like the Matrix. <laughs> so unplugged represents all that information. So now we go to dog. Okay. Scientists wanted to study something about dogs, stimuli and response, and what happened was they built this really large sized dog maze, about the size of this room, and they lined the entire floor with kind of chicken wire so they could run an electrical charge through it, and they put this dog in there. And so they put the dog in the little thing, now this is pretty gross and I don't approve of this or what have you, but at least we can maybe learn from the findings, okay? But they put the dog in this dog sized maze and they shocked its little paws and boop, dog hightails it out of there, finds its way through the maze. So they keep on doing this dog in the maze, zap it, boom, zap, boom, stimuli response, stimuli response. We've all heard of that type of stuff, right? So then, next part of the experiment, they take the little doggy and they put him in a harness, kind of like a straight jacket, can't move. Put him back in the maze, shock its little paws, it tries to move, it can't. Shock it, try, move, try, 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 try. Finally, the dog just gives up. And they shock its little paws, it tries to move, or it just doesn't even try to move. They shock its little paws and it just stands there. They shock it again and they're watching, it just stands there, just passively taking these shocks now. But the real interesting part of this experiment was then they took the dog out of the harness. And they shocked its little paws and it just stood there. It was completely free to move. It was no longer harnessed. And they shock it again, it just said shock, 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 shock. And this came to be known as the learned helplessness phenomena. That as a result of being harnessed for a period of time, even when that harness was now removed, it acts as though it is still harnessed. Okay, so the learned helplessness phenomena. So we have unplugged, this automatic thinking mind with all the self-talk. We have dog, which is the learned helplessness phenomena. And now we go to dreams. Okay, researchers were really curious back in the 60s what dreaming was. What function did it serve? What was the purpose of us dreaming every night? They knew that we dreamed every night. They had discovered in the late 50s, early 60s that everybody dreams every night. No question. We might not remember them or be able to recall them, but this process happens in our brain. And what purpose did it serve? But they didn't have the sophisticated equipment that we have today for analyzing brainwave activity and all this other kind of stuff, so they had to figure out an experiment. And so what they decided they were going to attempt to do was they were going to attempt to study the dreamless mind. And so at that time they knew that when dreaming began, that rapid eye movement would occur. Right? And so then it, whenever you began to dream, your eyes would dart back and forth and back and forth. So they got their dream research lab all set up and the, the subjects agreed that every time the rapid eye movement would begin, that their sleep would be interrupted and those dreams would be interrupted. So the, the, the experiment begins and there they are, sleep, REM, interrupt, sleep, REM, interrupt, sleep, REM, interrupt, sleep, REM. After only three days, of doing this experiment, it was called off. It was announced to the world what they had done, and they were told they put out whatever you do, never do research like this again. That they found that what was happening was completely and totally unethical. Because what happened to the people in the dream research lab is they all became very disturbed. They all became very angry, very uncomfortable with life, suicidal, violent. And some were so disturbed that they actually attempted suicide. All because they were not allowed to dream. So 20 years later, they decide to study what dreams were really all about again. Except now we've got all these incredible tools and we can map brainwave activity and exactly where it's going on and what lobes of the brain and all this kind of stuff and study the... And what they, one of the things that they found is that there was absolutely no difference, zero difference, between the brainwave activity that occurs when we're dreaming at night and the brainwave activity that occurs 
when we're daydreaming in the day. That the process that takes place in the brain is identical. That regardless of whether you're dreaming at night or dreaming at day, that what's happening in your brain Precisely, when you're visualizing how you want to build something or you want to go somewhere or how you want to change your life or get a new job or planning a vacation, that type of daydream. There's no difference between that visualization during the daytime and at nighttime when you're dreaming. They have the same effect on the human body. So now comes the significance of unplugged dog dreams. Is there anything we've talked about so far that might be waking us up from our dreams. And I submit to you now that we want a better life. We want a better world. We want to see things change. We want to increase our income. We want some changes in our life and we want to grow and expand and what have you. And at the very same time while we are dreaming those dreams for ourselves, we've got this four to one negative ratio that's sitting there waking us up. Get real, get real, get real, get real. And then we sit in a state of learned helplessness. And we have this harness of negative thinking that is occurring that keeps us in a state of learned helplessness. Now, on a scale in the psychology of it all and in the world of psychology, a one-to-one -one ratio, so one positive thought, one negative thought, would be ideal. <laughs> That would be the balanced human being. A two to one is kind of an irritable human being. A three to one is someone who has outbursts and kind of anger every now and then. A four to one is considered post-traumatic stress disorder. Five to one is considered manic depressive. Six to one is considered BPD, borderline personality disorder. Seven to one, schizophrenia. 8 to 1, you're psychotic. What is this ratio? I didn't catch that. This is the positive to negative thoughts. So 1 to 1 is like you're balanced and everything's cool. 2, you're kind of irritable. 3, you can be angry pretty re regularly. 4 to 1, post-traumatic stress disorder. So basically, the research that has gone out and that has proven that basically the entire population of the United States, as well as the world, is living in post-traumatic stress disorder.